Roger. That's a good on spacewalk, Roger. Confirming EVA. Over. Oh, <laughs> I think I may have broken the illusion there for a second. In honor of today's uh, historic spacewalk, where NASA had a spacewalk with all female astronauts, which is great in terms of visibility and diversity, and we probably should have done it 50 years ago. In honor of that, I decided to do a quick calculation. How far have people actually walked in space? And I want to consider this kind of weird math because when you consider astronauts moving, usually, when they're doing an EVA, extravehicular activity, when they're outside of um, some kind of atmosphere, some kind of ship, that's what defines an EVA. They're usually on the International Space Station here, the ISS, but it doesn't seem like they're moving around all that much, but that's deceptive because EVAs and spacewalks are very, very hard and they take a long time because you have to be very careful and you're in big bulky suits doing complicated things. So. Let's see if we can add up all the times for all of the spacewalks ever, or at least the most spacewalks that lasted the longest accumulated time, and see if we can equate that to some kind of walking in space time to give you a better sense of just how much work goes on up here above our heads. So if you add up all of the times for the 30 astronauts who had the most EVA time, you can get a total value that is pretty consequential, which is 1400 almost 1500 hours that is a lot of time spent spacewalking now the average pace for just your average human walking is not all that fast it's like less than three miles an hour so if you multiplied this very slow walking pace by the total amount of time people have been spacewalking you can probably come within a ballpark figure for how far we would have walked in space if people in spacesuits were just walking around based on these EVA times and if you do that you get 5800 kilometers which is over three and a half thousand miles worth of spacewalking because some of these astronauts have spent over 80 hours in their career spacewalking so this is a very long distance how long is this distance how how much have we spacewalked well let's consider the Kármán line which is a line where we loosely determine where space starts which is about a hundred kilometers up above the Earth's surface. This is where there is less atmosphere than not, where most of the Earth's atmosphere is below, rather. So comparing these two values, you can see that we have spacewalked, according to our very general calculations, if we were really spacewalking, we could walk to space and back a full 58 times in the, amount of, in the amount of spacewalking distance that we've actually accomplished. So, while it seems like not much work is happening up on the ISS when they're just floating around and it doesn't look like they're moving all that much, we spent a lot of time working on our space stuff. So much so that if we were actually spacewalking, we could walk to space and back with our own little Pete's 58, nearly 60 times. And I think that's amazing. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Because Science Live, the live version of the Because Science channel where I take all of your comments, questions, and corrections, and weird comments about my hair and face, and I try to address them off the top of my head, whoo, live. I don't know what's gonna happen. Look, I'm not a working scientist. I'm not an expert in any one thing, but I know a little bit about a lot of sciencey and pop culture-y things. So if you have any questions for me, put it in the chat on YouTube where you're watching this. Please do not spam or else I'll never answer you. And Voice of the Void Nate can get to your questions, hopefully. And again, in honor of all spacey lady kind of stuff, we have our very own space lady, Dr. Moo is back. Ooh, hey Kyle. Hey, I didn't see you float in here. Here. Wait, are you also floating? I, I yeah, oh, uh, not okay. anymore. Now, now the gravity has been turned on. So right. I'm so stable. happy with the sci-fi technology that figures that out. <laughs> Nate, what do we got? Uh, first question is from Sam Average Man. The Average Man. How large? How large is our moon compared to the rest of the moons in our solar system? And how much larger would it have to be to be considered a planet? Wow. How big is our moon, Moo? Well, our, I don't know the number off of the top of our head, but with respect to all the other planets in our solar system, it's actually quite small and weird and irregular. Uh, if you look at the, the moons that are farther out in the outer planets, they are quite large. The Titans, the, the, the rocky bodies, the icy moons, uh, they're quite large. 
But yeah, I don't know the number off the top of my head. Do you you know the number off the top of your head, smart man, Kyle? Is it 10 to the 22 <laughs> kilograms, I believe, is the mass of the moon? Uh, so it's it's much smaller. It's orders of magnitude smaller than the Earth. Um, so it's very small. I don't know what it is compared to the other uh, moons in our system. How much more mass would it need in order to uh, overcome internal forces and become more spherical and clear its orbit of other stuff, which is what we use the IAU, International Astronomical Union, uses <laughs> uses to define what a planet is. The reason why Pluto is not a planet is because it do, it's not as spherical as it could be if it had more mass and it hasn't cleared out its orbit of other bodies, which planets usually do with their gravity, either attracting them or hitting them or flinging them out of the system or whatever. So uh, the moon would need, like we said, orders of magnitude more mass, 10 times heavier, 100 times heavier. I don't know the exact value, but much heavier to answer your question, generally. And if you want to put it in the chat, I believe it's some value times 10 to the 22 kilograms mm. is the mass of the moon. Uh, 7.35 to wow. the 22. Oh! Yeah. Man. Man, you get asked the same question enough times, it starts to stick in there. From Ultra Flygon, why do scientists say that uh, wherever there's water, there's a possibility of life? Couldn't an extraterrestrial intelligent species live without water? That's a great question. At least life as we know it really needs water. Most of our bodies is comprised of water. So that's a really great way, a surefire way to say, hey, if we have water there, there's a high possibility that at least life could be sustained. Whether or not life actually exists is another question. Could life exist without water? Sure, anything is possible. But well, not, not life as we know it. Not anything. <laughs> I'm not going to start. Anything. I'm not going to start flying anytime soon. But uh, <laughs> exobiology is hard because if you think about it, the number of participants in our study named "What is life like?" is one. It's us and everything on Earth. So we do not have more data points than what is on Earth. And so the reason why exobiologists and scientists and astronomers look for signatures of life that are similar to Earth is there methane in the atmosphere? Is there water? Is there liquid water on the surface? Are there oceans? The reason why that is more tantalizing than other things is because we already have a data point that says that life could exist there. So if you imagine all the possibilities of life, as, as Moo pointed out, there are probably a vast range of different ways that life could exist, but we know how life could exist in at least one of those ways. And so the most efficient way to start looking for life would be to look where you already suspect it might be. Otherwise, you're searching blind. Yes, there could yep. be like silicon-based life or something like that, but we don't know anything about that at all. Exactly. Could, so, uh, so just and and all this searching, all of this science costs time and money and effort. So, if you're going to send a probe to a planet to look for life, let's start with what we know. Yep. The, ge the general idea. I mean, you don't just blow a billion dollars for no reason, unless you're, you know, a Bezos who can <laughs> wrap his money around the sun, literally. <laughs> Uh, this next name is really hard to pronounce, so I'm just going to say MH for initials. Oh, they're going to be so disappointed. How would you measure the strength of dogs' jaws? Asking for a science project. Oh. What kind of science project? Um, so measuring the strength of the bite of animals, bite force, uh, could be pretty straightforward. What you'd want to get is something called a force gauge, and you can just dress it up in a way that won't damage the animal and won't damage the instrument, and then you can induce the animal to bite down on that instrument. We do the same thing with like crocodiles and sharks and what have you. You can also estimate biting forces and values from uh, data about skulls and muscles. It's obviously better just to get the raw experimental data from something like a force gauge, um, which I believe you can buy online for not too expensive um, if you're looking to do a project on it. Um, but uh, for something like a T-Rex, I know I have uh, friends like Dr. John R. Hutchinson who has helped us on the show before. He looks at the cranial structure of like T-Rexes and reconstructs digitally uh, bones and muscles to get a value, a theoretical value on bite force. But if you want to do this for your project, I would say force gauge is where you want to look. But also, before you do anything with animals, 
you must be very, very sure that the animal is not going to be harmed in any way by this testing and is as informed as possible. You do not want to be exploiting, causing any stress uh, to, say, your dog just to get a force uh, value. So if it does look, I'm not suggesting anything, but, you know, it might be easy enough for a school project to... Uh, cut open its favorite toy a little bit and insert the force gauge there and then just play a little bit of fetch or a tug of war with your animal and you might be able to get a decent force rating there. I wouldn't try the I wouldn't try to force an animal to do anything. We still have to be ethical even if dogs don't have themselves ethics. And that's the nice thing about models, just like what you're saying with the skeletal structure. You can compare existing models to existing data and see how good the models are and refine that. Exactly. So yeah, if, when you're when you you always want to check your theory with actual data. Did, mm -hmm. I think uh, Feynman said that? It says uh, he said if your theory doesn't fit with experiment, it's wrong. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the times, scientists will have their own pet theories about how mm -hmm. things work, but before you actually test it, you don't really really know. And you're right. That is a good feedback loop to yeah. see. Well, was I right about the Way I'm thinking about mm -hmm. this. What's next? Uh, this is a Magic the Gathering question. Oh, oh from, not you for know, me. You know a lot about that, huh? From uh -huh. Royce Heflin. What do you think about Magic the Gathering players who use black zombie decks? Hmm, overrun style zombie decks. What do you got? Uh, Liliana Dreadhorde General in there. Yeah, you know, I, I mono black can be really, really strong depending on the format. Uh, in in standard, I don't think it's really strong right now. I've seen some uh, strong EDH. Uh, mono black decks but usually because of the color uh, because of the color restrictions unless you're running something like Crick, Son of Yawgmoth, uh, because of the color restrictions it black has a hard time um, it, it's really good at drawing cards and getting stuff from the graveyard but it has a hard time removing problematic enchantments and artifacts so mono black is uh, can be very strong but going wide with a bunch of zombies which can be wiped out by a board wipe pretty easily not always the best case unless you can really take advantage of that through something like a scarab god like effect or a varina uh, like effect i know a lot about magic cards i just realized what's next <laughs> from tesla ranger what are the best and worst fictional examples of spacesuits you've seen Ooh, okay. That's uh, you first. Well, I'm just trying to think of all the best examples that I know of. Best and worst spacesuits. I mean, I could go with best. I mean, the Apollo 13. All of the all of the movies that utilize NASA scientists as consultants, they obviously have the best and most accurate depictions of spacesuits. Worst? I can't think of any. I just saw the uh, 40th anniversary re-release of Alien in theaters and mm. the IMAX, which was amazing. Uh, it was really, really cool. And I liked how their spacesuits were bulky. I mean, this mm. was back in the 70s, right? Uh, 70s and 80s. And so they were very bulky because they have to accommodate a lot of equipment and a lot of life support and the material has to be a certain way so that it can protect you from the hundreds of degrees swing of difference whether you're in shadow or in uh, the, or in sunlight yeah. so it, it's hard to pin down but I would say that the media that portrays spacesuits as little more than a helmet are probably closer to fictional than the ones that are more bulky, that have more equipment on them. Stuff yeah. you see, uh, like The Expanse does this, I think, pretty well, strikes a pretty good balance. Uh, Alien is is good. Uh, as Dr. Moo mentioned, the Apollo movies and things that deal mm -hmm. with real NASA, The Martian's pretty good in that respect. Yep. But things that just look like, <laughs> you know. Like, like a jumpsuit. Jumpsuit or getting closer, like a sexualized kind yeah. of spacesuit where it's like contour, very contoured and stuff. Those nah. are closer to fictional because you want to separate the vacuum of space from your body as much as possible. And that's hard to do unless you have really, really robust materials and great technology. Um, the new SpaceX spacesuits look much sleeker and much mm. sexier, so to speak, kind of like that, but they're still going to be bulkier than most stuff you've seen in science fiction. And, and you're not going to just wear a helmet. Yeah. You need a pressure suit. <laughs> exactly. Or else you're going you're gonna to puff up. You're going to puff up like you're a poor fish being raised from the depths of the ocean back to the surface. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Haven't you ever seen uh, that? Got, yeah, like the you blobfish. Got a graphic really quick. The blobfish. If you pull a fish, if you pull a deep sea fish back up to the surface, sometimes yeah. it, its guts will come out of its mouth. Yeah. The blobfish doesn't look all that sad in real life. Yeah, yeah. Get off the blobfish's blobby, ba blobby back. Yeah. Hashtag blobfishes are beautiful. <laughs> From Dominic <laughs> Slauson. I'm not gonna say any hashtag. Will terraforming always be part of science fiction? Or will it one day be science Ooh. fact? 
Hmm, Dr. Moody. Yeah, that's a great question. So terraforming is a really tough problem, or not problem, but it's a tough endeavor, right? Um, so in order to get a planet to take to plants, you have to make sure you have the right humidity conditions, temperature conditions, the soil has to be right. So there's a lot that you have to do just to get it ready to plant seeds and, and plants and vegetation. And so will it ever be science fact? Sure, yeah, There's there are things that you can do. Uh, there are people that say that you should nuke the nuke <laughs> Mars to get it ready, which I don't agree, I don't know about that. You can watch the episode we did on it if you want to know more. Oh yeah, also, <laughs> there's gonna be an episode on that. Shall I say that now? Shall no, I save it? No. Okay. There might no. be an episode on it, so. But we did a nuking Mars episode as well. You know, terraforming is, is theoretically possible. Theoretically possible. Mm -hmm. Practically is the problem. It takes, this, this is, Terraforming a planet would be, terraforming a planet on purpose and in a short amount of time would be the most, uh, would be the largest scale engineering project that humanity has, has ever taken. Right now, we have terraformed, so to speak, we have changed the environment of planet Earth on accident over hundreds of years since the Industrial Re Revolution with climate change and so on. But if you wanted to induce a change in an entire planet's atmosphere and ecosystem in a short amount of time, maybe decades or something like that, this would require so much resources, so many resources, uh, so much science, so much engineering that it would be very hard for, let's say, us to terraform Mars within our lifetimes, yeah. definitely. Um, we haven't even been there yet. And I think some of the first missions probably won't get there until the, the 2030s anyway. So, or, you know, if we believe Maybe. Elon Musk, we'll yeah. see. But, uh, Terraforming theoretically possible. I'd like to see some of those technologies tried out here at home yeah. as well. So, you know, we don't have to evacuate. Uh, one uh, more question. One more very fast. From <laughs> okay. Twilight Lupine Silva. If space is cold, what is your blood boil in your body without a spacesuit? Ooh, that's a good question. I don't know, do you want to take this one? I don't know why your blood would boil. Your blood boils because when you remove the outside pressure pushing down against your body, which is 14.7 pounds per square inch right now, if you're on Earth, I don't know where we are, but if you're on Earth, you have 14.7 pounds per square inch of atmosphere pushing on every inch of your skin right now. If you remove that, your, the amount of gas that your blood can hold under 14.7 PSI is a certain amount of gas that can dissolve into your blood at that pressure level. If you remove all of that pressure, it's in effect like opening a soda can. What happens? They, they fill soda cans up at a certain pressure, and when you release that pressure, what, what happens? And then it starts to bubble out, because at a different pressure, the same liquid cannot hold the same amount of gas. And so when you are spaced, your blood can suddenly not hold the same amount of gas, and so some gas must necessarily dissolve out of it, bubble out of it, and your blood, in effect, then boils. This is what happens uh, when you try to cook at higher uh, elevations. Elevations, yeah. that's right, uh, because you are removing pressure, and therefore the the liquid cannot hold as much gas, and it makes it easier to boil. So your blood boils in space because there's no pressure in space because there's nothing in space. <sighs> Thank you for watching this edition of Because Science Live. Thank you, Dr. Moo, for being here. What's happening Monday? Because space is returning. What? You all have been asking for it. Oh, <laughs> we're, we're delivering. We have a new uh, lineup of Because Space episodes coming up for you. The first one on Monday. Let's wait to see. Let's not say the topic just yet. You're going to okay. have to tune in on Monday, but it's about spacey stuff, and Dr. Moo knocks it out of the park, maybe even out of the solar system, maybe. Maybe. Next week, we also have, <laughs> of course, new footnotes on Dr. Manhattan and why his superpowers are the way they are. We have a new live stream, and we have an episode that I am very excited for that you are all going to have a lot of a lot of disagreements and agreements with, and it has to do with a certain kind of anime something. Uh, so, so cool. It's, it's going to be very <laughs> cool. So stick around for that, and uh, have a wonderful rest of your weekend. If you're in Madison, Wisconsin, tomorrow night, I will be talking in Madison, Wisconsin about science and Star Wars. Come out and see me. If you are not subscribed to the channel right now, and you're just checking out the live stream, make sure to subscribe and hit that bell so you can actually get all the notifications for all the normal videos that we're putting up Again, have a wonderful rest of your weekend and be nice to each other because this is That's all we awesome. got.